At Nottingham itself, which yeah. is uh, one of the very few instruments which uh, are two-sided. The Bandonium opens in, in two directions. But the reed assembly is available on, on two sides. So I, I modulated one side against the other side. And that, that was the beginning of uh, the piece Bandonia. There were ten microphones on the instrument on the Bandonian including contact microphones, the same type of technology that they were using for John Cage's cartridge music, and which he had used for a piece he had done with Rauschenberg in Stockholm in 1964. And these are of the nature of a phonograph cartridge which has a, a place where you can insert a needle, so that would be a, a point of contact onto the Bandonian. One side of the Bandonian was going into the part of the frequency modulator, the other side another complex sound, and, and the results of cross-modulating two things that are quite different but already have, in, in, in their pitch characters, but already have very complex spectrum, acoustical spectrum. You can hear it. It's all <laughs> It becomes massively complex spectral output. So there are several of several of these contact microphones and also some air microphones. The air microphones didn't just pick up what was coming out of the bandoni, it picked up what was also in the air. I mean, it, it was already a kind of mixer you didn't have to plug into the wall or have batteries. It was a kind of mixer with a delay line, mind you. The whole armory became a feedback instrument that he could perform with. Within Bandonian Factorial, he had circuits that were feeding back, producing uh, sound on their own. He would create feedback internally through an electronic circuit. A lot of the sound modification devices ha had to deal with, with uh, home-built equipment that I had built myself. And I had discovered this uh, uh, principle of what's called a saturated amplifier where you, you arrange feedback around an amplifier to the point where, where the, the circuit oscillates of itself. All you have to do is activate it by putting a signal in it, and it, it can keep oscillating forever and ever, which is one of the features of the piece. I found some the transducers that were made to uh, activate walls. The blurbs about them were, all had pictures of uh, car showrooms. <laughs> the first use of, by David Tudor of resonant objects, which are turned into loudspeakers through the use of a transducer that is almost like a speaker without a cone. So when you attach it to an object, the object becomes the speaker. By passing sounds through the objects, you get a version of the sound, which is uh, modified according to the special resonant frequencies of a given object. I had the possibility to utilize remote controlled carts, so I, I made constructions. I sent sound into them and caused them to run about the room. This gave the opportunity for the sound to get very close to the audience and, and move away from it, so it was like a variation, a spatial variation. My memory is that I was running one of several of those remote devices that were rolling around on the floor. I had a kind of joystick controller, as I remember. I could decide what direction it went. When those moving sound sources went around, it's not that you heard the sound coming right from that one, but the whole acoustical space was changing at the same time. I was very much impressed by the acoustics of the armory. In the armory, the sound goes away and comes back some five seconds later, and so there's Sound, sound, sound. The armory was known for its long echo, which we measured up to six seconds, which before we moved in, we knew about and which horrified us. When David uh, discovered it and John discovered it, they realized that they had another dimension to play with. I found David one day on the balcony with a signal generator and a microphone. He turned on the signal generator and twisted the microphone uh, 180 degrees back and forth, picking up the signal when it had bounced off 
uh, the one wall of the armory and coming back again. I usually think of it uh, as if David were playing the whole armory as an instrument. Cross took the sound from the bandonian from two microphones and fed it into his uh, sound visualization systems. He wanted the same thing on a larger scale that I had done, which was to make electronic XY kinetic visual imagery an adjunct to electronic music performance. Well, Lowell had had come up with an idea. He had an old television set and had removed the, the leads to the yoke, the part that actually deflects the image and forms the picture on it. Turned his TV set into a large, rather crude oscilloscope. He would play stereo music into it. He would play music by a composer he didn't particularly like and that everyone agreed was not a good composer. And the images would, would not be very exciting. So then he would play a piece by a composer that he liked, and the images would be really good. And so he came up with this musicological theory that, that this instrument could actually, this TV set could actually pick out good music and, and from bad music. And David just thought this was the greatest thing. He would just, they would sit there for hours playing, you know, sounds and just roaring in front of this thing and deciding who was good and who wasn't good. David loved the, the way this image worked, so they uh, decided to do something. I got to see him play the bandonian before I composed this piece, Musica Instrumentalis. He could play the bandonian and see the results of what he was doing on a TV screen. I had made drawings of what I thought he might be able to achieve on the TV screen. reported after the piece was over, I was able to do at least three or four of those. He had this opportunity to draw upon a lot of technology for the nine evenings, and he wanted me to make video images projected onto a large screen surface. I first thought that I could just simply do the same thing to that video projector that I did to my home TV sets. So I wired it up that way, and it worked beautifully at first, but I burned up all the phosphor on the cathode ray tube that uh, was responsible for the projection, and so that pretty much killed that idea. To resurrect matters, I used an oscilloscope, which I brought with me from Toronto, and we had TV cameras on the oscilloscope screen, and the TV cameras then fed the video projectors, and it didn't burn up anything. One of my engineers uh, gave me a, a rather antiquated but very beautiful device which would act as a microphone. You could call it a complex microphone. It was actually a set of harmonium reeds. Setting that up as a microphone meant putting the sound through these harmonium reeds so that specific frequencies would excite specific reeds. So there I had one uh, trigger device which could trigger lots of things. So I set out to program the whole shebang. During the performance, David sat there with his bandonian, uh, and these devices were connected uh, up with it. This is where the sound comes in and goes through a set of tone controls and then an amplifier. Comes out here on this connector and goes into the main box. Here we have a bank of reeds from a reed organ. Each one of them is tuned to uh, a note on the tempered scale of music. And there's a sensor finger down here that detects a vibrating reed. And when that reed vibrates in sympathy with the sound coming in, then it goes through to an integrator where it's turned into a solid logic signal and then comes out on the connector board. And from there it gets connected to all the things that 
tutor used uh, in the night evening's performance. The Vochrome, as a frequency sensitive switching device, was used to turn on and off the 1000 watt theatrical lamps which were located around the balcony of the armory. Some more uh, localized lighting around the platform where he was performing was controlled by the device invented by Waldauer. A box with a, a white plastic cover divided into 16 squares, right. four by four. Underneath the, this translucent panel were some light sensitive devices. So that if you shine a flashlight on it, you would turn on a tone that corresponded to that particular square. And there were 16 different tones, just dif different pitches. All these the frequencies would be mixed together and come out on this one place mm -hmm. in the back. And that could, that could go by a single wire receivers, or they could go to FM transmitters and they would transmit these frequencies around the room. With the acoustics of the uh, armory and, and the speakers all around it, you could move the sound around and it was really a, a magic thing. I mean, it just was wonderful. So I ended up with three kinds of triggering devices, one through, through light, one through uh, audio triggers. It was proportional to, to the uh, volume of sound being made by the Dandonian. And then switching, which was accomplished through this, this harmonium device. <laughs> All I had to do was play this instrument. <laughs> and the whole thing was set in motion. He had no composition beforehand, but he activated all of the elements of the piece. And this idea that the piece composed itself during its performance gave David multitude of possibilities, both as a performer and possibilities for the audience to experience the piece. As the event went on and the sound, first the acoustic sound and then the modified acoustic sound would go on and on, at some point it would fire off a device that had been set so that the sound would gradually get more and more complex. But he still had some control over it. He could, he could stop the bandonian from moving. But that didn't necessarily stop what was happening. It influenced rather than controlled the situation. It was certainly spectrally rich, so there was there was there was lots of noise stuff. But he, you know, all the while there was a, you know there was a, an aesthetic behind it and a, and a real sensitive person driving it. Despite the fact that it was using these devices that were being driven into all sorts of non-linear modes. It was just a very well thought out, very, very pure and, and just very clean and pure. 